And welcome back to another Gutter Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. In today's Tactical Podcast, we are joined by Darius of Prepared Mentality. You can find him on Instagram at Prepared Mentality. You can find him um, on PreparedMentality.com, which is, I might add, a really nice, smooth-looking website with a lot of really cool features on it. Um, YouTube prepared mentality i like it when it's all the same it's all plush and it all looks good so darius welcome on to the show bro thank you so much glad to be here thanks for coming on man so we have a lot to talk about tonight it is a crazy environment that we're living in stateside right now man um you are a former mp you're currently still in the military reserve army reserve and um we were just talking, and you were saying, "Well, I hope maybe I'll get an opportunity to go overseas, man." I don't know, man. You might need uh, you might be needed here stateside after a little bit, dude. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you never know uh, what the future may hold and what events might happen. So who knows? That's anybody's guess at this point, man. Um, I was looking on your website, and you have a really cool option for basically assisting people in their preparedness planning. And uh, full disclosure, I have a similar um, service on my website, but I really like what you guys are doing with it. You not only offer that service, you also offer manuals, reports on how people can stay safe. So if they don't want to go all the way and do a consultation with you, they can at least pick up, you know, and it's really not expensive. I think it's about five bucks for a manual, and that's going to give a lot of great information as well. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about this, these services? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, th- the basic concept for prepare mentality is keeping it simple, keeping it a source so people can go there, kind of look at what we do, and definitely kind of get a perspective on emergency preparedness. That's where prepare mentality comes in. You know, we have FEMA, we have uh, the first aid, and and we have all these other government entities. Uh, but there's nothing really out there to get people really engaged in emergency preparedness. Um, th- there are your cert teams again, that that's FEMA as well. Uh, but again, I was looking for something that people can just identify with. They can be a source, make it plain and simple for them to, to get. And really the manuals are there. Like you said, they're up there for people, uh, to download. And we also have the consultation where we go through different preparedness plans for families, uh, and businesses. Uh, so again, it's just inviting people to a more, simple lifestyle of preparedness no that's well said man um a simple lifestyle of preparedness and you know when it comes right down to it one year ago we would have been talking and a lot of people would have said what are you guys out of your freaking minds about this prepping stuff and now dude like all of those same people have been calling me and i'm sure calling you off the hook and saying what do i do now so you know it's funny to see how a little bit of um, economic and political instability, yeah. and all of a sudden people find how relevant this information really is. Mm-hmm. How did you get um, started doing all of this preparedness? And I hate the term prepping, by the way, because it makes it sound like you're a freaking camouflage guy out in the woods somewhere. But how did right. you get involved in emergency preparedness? Well, I first started uh, in New Jersey. That's where I was born and raised in New Jersey. Uh, as a firefighter, you know, I started in my, my local community uh, and I started in firefighting and fire rescue. And then I went on to the hazmat unit, went to the fire academy uh, and kind of got my inspiration and got my details of emergencies in that area. Uh, and then I branched off into the army, went into the military. And then I got another perspective of emergencies. Uh, and then I got more into the FEMA aspect of things, into the emergency management side. Uh, when dealing with emergency disasters uh, and such. And so I kind of got the idea like, hey, you know, this is something that I'm really enjoying. This is something that I picked up really fast. Uh, And all of my experience up until now, which I'm continuing my education in Homeland Security, uh, got me, you know, to the point where I'm able to teach people about emergency preparedness. So I got my start, you know, really in the local community with my fire department. We will have to talk offline about that. I'm actually a uh, very similar man, New Jersey firefighter myself, so we probably know some of the same people. Um, so one thing that you just said that I really pick up on is 
you're never stopping educating yourself. You're never going to stop learning it. That really is in my book, the truest mark of a warrior is somebody who realizes that the game's never finished. You always just want to keep learning. What do you do to keep yourself sharp? um, Even when you're not, you know, going and training with the, uh, with your military unit and all of that, what kind of things do you like to do to stay, um, to stay in that mindset? Uh, well, a few things is doing a monthly, I do a monthly preparedness list, uh, and I have things that I mark off every month that I check, whether that be my vehicle, whether that be with my weapons, uh, whether that be with my inventory of preps. Uh, so these are just little things that people can do, and I tell people all the time that you can start simple, you can start at home. Uh, so for me, I kind of implement the same thing. You know, I do the monthly check, uh, and then also go out my way to find other training whether that be in combatives, whether that be more in my weaponry, uh, whether that be more in first aid and my medical, uh, just go out there and find different people that, that you trust and you can learn from uh, and get, gain some more knowledge because uh, we can ne- never have enough knowledge uh, and just kind of go out there and train and put yourself in uncomfortable situations. I say when people are more uncomfortable, they're able to adapt to emergencies better. Uh, so I hold that philosophy strong. Um, Because if you're just comfortable in your situation, you're never going to learn from your mistakes. You're never going to learn from emergencies or disasters. So I kind of encourage people just to get enough training uh, or as much as they can uh, during this time. And it is difficult going out there and getting training now. Um, I think people really should have been training a few years ago, right? But, I mean, for uh, for those guys and girls out there, what would you tell them who don't have any experience and say, well, now I've all of a sudden bought into this Kool-Aid, right? Now I'm saying I want to get prepared. Right. Where do they start? Yeah, well, you know, like you said before, we've seen a major uptake in people wanting this type of information about emergencies, disasters, about helping, you know, their fellow man, helping their families. Uh, so, again, I would say for anybody to do what they're doing, if they're listening to this podcast, you know, they're already doing it. You know, they're listening to resources like this, your podcast, you know, they're going to my website, you know, they're contacting me. Uh, And also I I go and tell people, go to your local library. You know, there's nothing like a good book. There's many resources out there on books about, you know, survival, preparedness, first aid, uh, gaining a skill. Um, So go out to your local library. And there's also YouTube, of course, there's the internet. You got to be careful what you look yeah. at on there because some of it is false. Some of it, you know, can be bad news. But again, you have to filter out that stuff and kind of gain the knowledge that you think is important for you, your family, and your situation. You say that people have to be careful what they're looking at. I think it's so true. You know, people can get wrapped up in these uh, Alex Jones things and nothing against Alex Jones per se, but um, you, you don't want to get like the wrong information coming your way and then get really paranoid or something. So. I think it is a good piece of advice, solid piece of advice that be careful what you're looking at and make sure it's from a reputable source. Um, One reputable source I have in mind right now would be Prepared Mentality at preparedmentality.com would be a good place to start. It does look like you actually have a very good kind of introduction to emergency, emergency preparedness, emergency survival um, on your website. I looked at tons of these, man, and um, it – it's a little bit confusing sometimes with guys and they, they want to spit like advanced knowledge out, but you really seem to have a grasp on the basics. And, um, I think the basics is really the most important part anyway. Mm -hmm. In the military, um, you start with the basics from what I've heard, because I haven't been in the military, but what I hear is that you guys start with the basics and you kind of keep training and training just Mm -hmm. in the more advanced basics. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we want to start with our mindset. That's the most important for a prepared mentality is to start with our mindset. If you can get your mind going and get through situations with your mind, you're able to control your emotions. You're not panicking. You're not stressed out when things happen uh, and dangers come. You know, you, you kind of have it most of the way. You know, the rest of the way is, is physical. But if you can get your mind engaged into what's happening and train your mind, uh, that that's a plus. Um, so for anybody, yes, it is about the basics. You know, we don't need all this fancy uh, tools and weapons and all, 
all the stuff that we go out there and we buy and spend our money on and you know we get into debt over this stuff and people try to wheel you in to buy their products you know you really don't need all of that you know you have to go by you know of course your surroundings of course what your situation is because everybody's situation is different everybody doesn't live in you know the wilderness or in the back country you know most of our population in the united states live in the cities so you kind of have to think about everybody's situation it's going to be different and the basics are key you know i tell everybody that i consult that if you have the basics down and you're able to train your mind you know you're halfway there for those of us living in the cities which again you said is honestly of most of the population um what is going to be the key differences between our emergency plan or our bug out plan and then somebody per se living in iowa or you know the midwest somewhere how would we want to think about doing things versus somebody who's already kind of in a safer location uh, for me it comes down to population uh the, the more people you have around you the more dangerous it is and that comes down to situational awareness as well uh, so, you know, if you're, you know, living in a seven story building in New York City, you know, you're definitely going to have to improvise in ways that you wouldn't have to if you were in the back country and you had, you know, five acres of land. Uh, of course, your security measures are definitely different. Again, with more people comes more danger. Uh, in the back country, you know, you definitely have a lot more uh, hidden areas uh, where you can definitely plan better. Um, if you're in an apartment, you can't really plan too much because you're kind of limited. You're limited to what you can do and what you cannot do because uh, you just don't have the space, you don't have the area, and you don't have the manpower. Uh, in that country, you know, you can have the manpower. You can invite, you know, some friends over. You guys can have a party. You know, it's a little bit different. Uh, so those are the main two things that I see is, you know, the limited space uh, and the population. Darius, how important is tactical training versus planning, learning things about, you know, navigation, route mapping, stuff like that. Because I know a lot of people get really wrapped up in, I want the shooting skills. I want the jujitsu skills. But when it comes down to it, I mean, would it be as important or maybe even more important to develop other skill sets as well as just those physical ones? Yeah, the, of course, those skills like the combat uh, training, uh, the weapons training, you know, the combatives, those things are, I call them extras, because not everybody is going to learn that type of stuff, especially if you're living a normal life. You know, you have a nine to five job, you have two kids, you got a wife, a dog, you know, <laughs> it's not your, your average lifestyle for the average person. Uh, and when I talk to people, you know, they're more concerned about, hey, am I going to lose my job? Hey, you know, am, how am I going to pay my car bill? Hey, am I going to be able to pay the mortgage for next month. You know, those are the type of things that people are interested in. So I kind of gear what you said as far as getting into the advanced training, which people can do, but getting into more of the basic skills. You know, do you have your food? Do you have your water? Do you have enough to last through the month um, and gain a skill? You know, that that's another important aspect of preparedness, emergency preparedness, you know, gain a trade, you know, learn how to build something, learn how to grow a garden, you know, st things that you can actually gasp and control within your local environment and you see progress throughout. Well said, well said. How important is physical, I guess I could say physical agility or strength in all of this? Very important. That, that comes second after mindset. Uh, after you prepare your mind, you have to prepare your physical house. Um, our health is definitely important. If we don't have our bodies, uh, then we can't really prepare uh, in the way that we need to and be prepared in the way that we need to. You know, you need to go out there and move your body, have some physical exercise, do something at home, uh, look at YouTube videos, get an exercise that you like, but do something to move your body, especially now since everybody's kind of, you know, locked up in different mm -hmm. areas. You kind of have to improvise and kind of gain certain knowledge about exercising in different ways that we necessarily haven't had to do before. Yeah, yeah, we're starting to do all these prison workouts and stuff, yeah. man, living like straight up freaking convicts over here. Yeah. But, you know, it's good. You've got to stay in shape. And um, I'm sure that, you know, being an MP in the Army, even on the reserves, you have to maintain a certain level of 
physical readiness yourself. Yeah. How do you prefer to do that? Do you uh, do a lot of running? Do you do push-ups? Uh, for me, my, my training, the first thing I do is do a little bit of uh, conditioning and running. Uh, that's the first thing. I want to get my heart rate up uh, mm -hmm. as much as possible. Uh, and then after that, I go after, you know, whatever muscle that is, whether that be, you know, on my legs or that be triceps, biceps. Uh, you know, I, I get into a little muscle workout after that, but I keep it simple, you know, nothing too crazy, you know, as long as I can keep my running going and I keep my muscles strong and my body's moving in some type of way, you know, that's really all you need. And, and diet, diet is important. You know, your diet is basically 50% of your physical body. So I'm glad you brought that up, man. Um, not only is it important in everyday life, but I would assume during an emergency situation, it would be doubly important to be getting those like good vitamins and nutrients. Right. And I know a lot of guys and girls out there really like to store up like the MREs or, you know, other freeze dried storable food. But is there a way that we can kind of diversify our food stock to when it comes down to when we need to eat it, that it's a little more tasty, a little more like nutritious for us? Yeah, um, definitely. There's been many products out there, uh, again, that are available now that you can buy vegetables, you can buy freeze dried vegetables, you can buy freeze dried fruits. Uh, there's ways to do it. Uh, the canned goods are definitely, they have their place, but in a long term scenario, you don't want to live off of canned goods if, if you, you know, need to do that uh that's why i say learn how to garden learn how mm -hmm. to plant something you know start with potatoes start with greens start with you know some type of vegetable that can get you started get you in the mindset and say hey i can do that i think that's the number one thing people get scared and they get turned off because of the fact that they think they can't do something mm. so once they try it for the first time and they see progress then that gives them the encouragement to start doing more of that and it starts becoming a healthy habit in their life. It just becomes a lifestyle after that. It really does become a lifestyle. And living healthy, living as a warrior, watching your diet, exercising, it becomes addictive. And I think there's a lot of guys and girls out there who, you know, like most of us, we work a nine to five, we come home exhausted, it's tough. We want to eat maybe a junk hamburger or something. But when you get down to it, you realize, hey, about, I want to eat some greens, like make my body feel good, get my exercise. And yes, you're doing it for a specific purpose, right? You're preparing for what's to come, but you're also like instilling, instilling those healthy habits into yourself, which yeah. is what you're saying is like so on point is every day you have to be thinking about your health, not just kind of like looking for one specific event. Right. I would say also, you know, I, I tell people as well, because a lot of people don't have the money to go out there and buy mm -hmm. you know, freeze-dried foods or expensive uh, non-perishable items. And so I tell people that, you know, make sure that we're ready now physically and mentally, but physically now, make sure that we have a healthy diet now, that when it comes to the point where we have to eat certain things that are not necessarily good for our diet, our bodies can consume that. And we're not going to be off the deep end when there's an emergency and we have to eat certain foods, canned goods, you know, high sodium, uh, fatty acids, things like that when it's time to do so. I really like that. I'm actually taking a note on that right now. Stay healthy yeah. while it's still easy to stay healthy. Yeah. Very smart. Um, now, talking about staying healthy, keeping active, having a good workout exercise routine, um, is there any particular type of like self-defense system as far as the hand-to-hand -hand stuff goes that you like, that you like to train in or that you would recommend for people? Um, I, I would find a good kickboxing class. I mm. say that because that is something that is most likely going to be available at your local karate gym. You know, com combatives, they might have combatives there, but there's different types of combatives. Um, you know, the whole Kung Fu, you know, there's the ninja stuff, and there's also the different types of uh, karate's out there as well. But if you can get a good kickboxing class in, uh, that gives you the basics. Um, and there are some self-defense classes out there that do that specifically. Um, but normally, when you go to a dojo or a karate uh, class, they do serve a kickboxing class along with that. So that's going to give you the basics. Uh, at least that's what I found. 
No, I think that's great advice. It really does give you the basics. It gives you, you know, the punches and the kicks and the knees to some degree as well. And you'll also get to do a little bit of light sparring, which I think is really what you need um, to prepare yourself for that inevitability, or should I say, eventuality of a uh, of a potential fight. So right. yeah, and then and then if you you know if you consider you know t- taking an advanced class in the batters or self defense class, then hey, you have the basics down. Now you can up it a notch. And yes. Get it through, yeah. Absolutely. So um, this is kind of one of those cliche questions that I almost don't want to ask, but when it comes to guys investing in their first firearm, um, what would you as an MP kind of advise your everyday average civilian to get for home defense? I use a nine mil. Nine millimeter uh, is going to be your standard um, because it's easier to find. Uh, Mostly every gunshot will have a nine mil. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I start there and then I also have this concept where, you know, you don't have to get the most expensive gun out there. I see a lot of beginners go out there and get, you know, the most expensive thing they see or what the gun shop guy told them that was best for them. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody is different and that comes to preparedness. Everybody's situation is different. Um, so I, I don't believe in the height where they say one gun or one type of uh, label is good for everybody. That's not the truth. You know, if you find a SIG and somebody else has a Glock, you know, don't be afraid to use your SIG. You know, don't be afraid, you know, to, to learn that one type of weapon first before you go out there and buy something expensive. Um, because what's going to fit you is not going to fit somebody else. Mm-hmm. And so you have to customize your weaponry to yourself, to your situation, and to your scenario. That's solid advice. I know a lot of people who really want to go out and buy the most expensive stuff and they think that it'll make them a better shot or a better operator, right? And um, right. we'll see, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about gold and silver, things like that for guys who uh, are worried about the financial stability of our nation right now? Would, uh, would precious metals, in your opinion, realizing that you're not giving financial advice, right. um, would it be a good idea to start thinking about things like that at this point? Uh, well, what I see is the, the trends and things that people will really need. Um, so when it comes down to a SHTF scenario or collapse, uh, gold and silver, yes, can be good in the long run, but that's if your, uh, your infrastructure is working properly or if you are about to get into a system that's going to be working properly. Mm. Now, if we come into a scenario where there is no infrastructure, there is no rule of law, people are not gonna be looking for gold and silver. They're gonna be looking for food and water. So that's the first thing that I tell people to do. You know, look at what you have. There's things, items around the house, you know, like oils, um, certain canned goods, uh, certain ammunitions, um, cert- certain items that you can barter. Barter items are going to be high on that list. Uh, things people will need. Things people will need to feed their families. You know, diapers. There's going to be babies. You know, let's let's face it. You know, the simple things count. And people aren't going to be necessarily worried too much about gold and silver. That's going to be in the long run when there's a new infrastructure, a new government involved. And okay, we can have a currency system where we can be advanced now and not be savages. But, <laughs> That, that that's my take on on that part now talking about people being savages this brings me brilliantly into my next question here what about hiding our stuff is there are there ways to start thinking about hey listen i've got six months worth of food and water and ammo here mm-hmm. but i don't want anyone to freaking come take it from me by force how do we handle that well what i say to people when I consult them, you know, they too have that worry, you know, they buy all this stuff and they come to their home and it's in one location and they feel they're going to get robbed. Um, and their stuff might be taken away by force, um, and or by a certain law that might be integrated into the system. Um, so there are ways to go about it. Uh, one of the sources that I found that works is having many caches. And when I say caches, I don't mean putting a cache in the ground. No. Modern day caches. So if say you live in, uh, let's just say Florida and you're traveling up, you know, the East coast, 
you have a cache in Georgia, and this cache is going to be a storage facility that you can locate, go to, and you're going to have different storage facilities going up the East Coast, if you please, or wherever your second, let's just say, bug out location is. Um, a lot of times people don't realize that storage facilities are a lot easier to, to have and locate and, and manage than, you know, caches underneath the ground on somebody's property that you don't own. You know, it's a little easier to manage. So I say use storage facilities along the way. You know, if you're on the East Coast, or if you're on the West Coast, wherever your second emergency location is to go, that's where your caches should be set up along that map line. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I like that a lot. And that takes into account that <clears throat> Not only are you uh, diversifying your supply, but you're also putting it potentially in different states. Right. Different states may have different laws and different rules, which right. could really be beneficial for our favor if we're looking at, you know, putting stuff away. Yes. So uh, how long has Prepared Mentality been in business now? Uh, we got started at the beginning of this year. Wow. You know, it originally formed because of the coronavirus. Um, I've had family members and friends before uh, the virus started back in November, December of last year, asking me about how to prepare for these things, you know, what they should have, what items they should have. And, and I kept looking at different sources online, really didn't see anything that I liked or I was engaged in or that made it easy for people to go in and just prepare simple things for their families to be safe uh, and not stress out. So that's when I made the mentality in January, uh, got the name, got the structure, and kind of put it all together. And then from there, we've just been getting traction ever since. And you guys certainly have been gaining a lot of traction. I noticed that you have over 1,400 followers just on Instagram alone, which is very impressive for somebody who started just this past January. Yeah. Um, what gave you the idea, I mean, from the name to the kind of platform that you're taking on Instagram, which is really just more about helping people than selling anything, which again is nice. It's a nice change. Right. And then also to the website, like what made you get this business, uh, I guess you could say model? Mm -hmm. Well, again, going back to my career as a firefighter in Jersey, you know, my mindset was always something I put first. You know, I figured if I can get through this situation that was in front of me and I trained my mind to get through that situation, then, hey, I'm good to go. And when something worse comes up, you know, I'll kind of understand, have the basics down of my level of stress, my level of panic, and the way I can handle it. And so that's what got me to uh, the mentality part. And I always wanted to be prepared, you know. Being prepared was always something that I did, even when we had local hurricanes. You know, I always wanted to have extra water. I always wanted to have extra food in the house. You know, my mom didn't know what I was doing. You know, they were like, what are you doing all this stuff? You know, so I always had to prepare in this part. But the mentality part, you know, I, I gradually got during my training as a firefighter in emergency management, emergency preparedness in the Army. Uh, so that's how that name got started. And as far as the business is concerned, it kind of just turned into helping people, like you said, uh, the, the main source of people getting the basics down. You know, it's nothing complicated about it. And I think a lot of people make it complicated for people to learn uh, about emergency preparedness or getting ready for disasters or uh, emergencies in their local area. Uh, so just making it simple, make it so people can understand it. And the business aspect, you know, that that's gonna come, like you said, we just started gaining traction this year. Uh, so my whole model is helping people and we want to keep that front and center when we do our business. Well said. I think that really if you can focus on your desire to help people get prepared and stay prepared, that's going to go so much further and people can pick up on that. They know that you're genuine about it. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons why you've been getting traction is because Frankly, and I'm not certainly not going to mention any names here, but there are some scumbags out there who just want to take people's money. Yeah. And, um, you know, I can tell with you, bro, that you're not one of those guys. You've got a genuinely caring attitude, which is, again, very refreshing in the tactical community because there's some, there's some sharks out there. That's for oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where do you guys want to go from here? I mean, you've, you've, you started in January. You've gotten... A lot of traction thus far, and I'm really honestly seeing you guys only 
building up steam. Are there plans in the works already for kind of expanding or are you guys going to just kind of steer and see where you're going? Yeah, uh, again, the opportunities have been coming, um, no fault of my own, but just the people have been engaging. Uh, and so we do have plans to get a facility once, you know, this whole virus thing uh, gets out of the way. Uh, we, my plan is to have a facility where people can come, uh, build, you know, emergency bags, uh, get a preparedness plan going, uh, and kind of do a face-to-face -face thing, you know, where we have, you know, an, an amusement park, kind of like an inside a uh, place where they can do rock climbing, you know, they, they can learn about weapons, you know, have a range. Um, we can have some fun stuff in there for the family, things like that. Uh, and then we've already been getting traction for a TV show from Discovery. So uh, I can't mention what, what it is yet. Um, but again, you know, there's things in the works and good things happening. But again, it's about gauging, engaging families, uh, engaging people in their preparedness journey. Um, and just spreading the word uh, that people should stay safe, not panic, and be able to pre protect themselves and their families. I really like what you guys are doing, and I definitely want to have you back on the show at some point and see where you've been and where you've been going, because I'm anxious to see um, where you guys go over the next year, because I really do get a good feeling about you guys. And I think that it's, it's cool to watch and cool to see. And, um, Darius, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. It's been a, it's been a freaking pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, guys, I want you all to remember until next time that you are your first and last line of defense. Don't forget to check out preparedness mindset. Over here is uh, Prepared Mentality, preparedmentality.com, Instagram, YouTube. Check out Darius's uh, respective videos on there because they're quite informative, and I was watching them earlier and actually learned a thing or two myself. I'm not afraid to admit that, and um, they're doing big things, and I'm really excited to see where they're going in the future. So once again, not to be a dead horse, Darius, but thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you again.